Downtown Dalton makes room for a new whiskey distillery. I think it'll do nothing but help. I mean, we're, we're a business-friendly town, and uh, the more businesses we have, especially here in downtown Dalton, uh, the better for everyone. Dalton distillers will be making authentic whiskey from an old family recipe. Owner Chuck Butler is keeping the tradition alive, following the footsteps of his father and grandfather, except Chuck is doing it legally. My whole life I'd always hear of Dad speaking of how he would grew up and he worked closely with his dad and all of his uncles and a lot of family members and it's a good close tight group of uh, family members and that's something that I wanted to offer. You know, the main thing I wanted is so that people could come in, they could tour a small historical building and, you know, watch my dad excited. You know, he's 73 years old now and I've never seen him this happy, this excited, where he's able to talk to complete strangers. And by the time he's talked to them over a 15, 20 minute tour, they feel like they've known him for a lifetime. Um, you know, it's fun to look at how you start out with raw ingredients we cook our cornmeal. We take our time after two days. We add water to it that we uh, filter through, a, I call it a redneck reverse osmosis filter. And uh, you know, you see the uh, fermentation come to life. And then whenever it's ready, you know, we have enough fermentation vats that people, when they come in to Dalton Distillery, they can see every stage of fermentation. Sometimes they can see the steel operating. Uh, so no matter what time somebody comes in and tours, they can, they're able to speak with my dad and they're able to uh, see some form of fermentation and able to leave with a sample of good product that my dad has made for over 65 years. He makes it the same way. In the 1940s and early 50s, small town America, plagued with remnants of sacrificial rationing from a war, Families did whatever they could to get ahead, and in most cases, just to make ends meet. It wasn't uncommon to use anyone and everyone for the family business. This was certainly the case for the Butler family. I got started when I was about six years old. My dad put me down in one. It's back over here. I mean, it's uh, to clean it. If there's any green or any blue, that's got to come out of copper because that's that's what's poisonous. That's where it gets a bad name. But uh, when I come out, it had to be, it had to look like a new penny. I mean, just scrub and, and wash and, and then drain everything out and get it ready to fill up with the beer that was ready to run and make. I'd grind them all for him and uh, uh, and I'd malt it, I'd keep the mash stirred up, and I later started having, I'd have the steel, I know when it was worked off, it was ready to run. He would work a job, I'd have it filled up, ready for him when he came in. Uh, all he had to do was uh, start it up and run it. Made it. I made it easy on him, because he'd worked a job and farmed and doing that too, so he just, uh, I'd have it ready, the steel filled up, and ready, ready to go when he came home from work. Yeah. One of the main things that I wanted to start up a true moonshine distillery is to let people, you know, know that my family done this to provide for their self, to provide for their family. Um, whenever they would raise corn, they done it for several reasons. One, to feed the livestock, to uh, grind into cornmeal, to eat for themselves to feed the chickens, for, to feed other livestock, but then they would also distill it. And they knew that alcohol won't go bad, it don't ruin, alcohol doesn't go bad, and you can sell it. 
and it was a respected profession because they was doing it properly, they was doing it safely, and they wasn't doing anything that would hurt somebody. You know, it would be a good way to barter. You know, if, the, if somebody come in and, and offered them some labor uh, to work in the fields, they could pay them with that. You know, so the main thing I wanted to let people know is it wasn't, my family wasn't out there to act like a bunch of redneck hillbillies breaking the law. You know, they, you know, one is backed by math and science. There's a true chemistry to making good moonshine. So anybody that makes good moonshine, if you taste it, you know that they are a smart individual. You know, and there's a major art and craft to it. And the main thing is a lot of people want to talk about being an outlaw and being rough and hurting people. You know, that probably existed, but it didn't exist in the realm that my family was in. Back in the days of Prohibition and the years following, especially in the Appalachian region, moonshining was a craft that often required partnering with the right people to be, shall we say, profitable. Everybody got cut down, I guess, just about. That's the term we use for the revenue agent. Get cut down. Uh, the local law enforcement was good to, they were good about uh, coming and, and notifying you, hey, the revenue's coming in. So what area do I need to look in? They'd tell you that. And uh, my dad would always show them what area to go. It had been there at one time, but it was no longer there. Now, if you was making, we call it poisonous whiskey, no, no. I mean, it, it making off tin or the, the old black pot, pot, which would kill you, it'd kill you. They, they, didn't, they didn't help you on that. But uh, some of them, they, they charged a fee for letting you buy. Some didn't. I, I mean, my dad didn't, he said, my, uh, he never did pay a fee. He just, uh, my vote, he thought his vote was enough. Now for young Raymond, it wasn't easy walking in his daddy's footsteps. Continuing with the family business led to some trouble of his own. On a few occasions, he had a few near misses himself. One time, it, it, I was caught just going into the steel. Uh, well, when everything is over with and I made bond, got back, uh, and I got two years probation, paid the lawyer to defend us, give him a couple of gallons of whiskey, the lawyer, moonshine, to defend me and the other guy that we got caught. And then we had another one set up, and the pro a federal probation officer come to see me. He had come to us. And I mean, when he came, he was in the car. He didn't even get out of the car, but I, he, I had to, uh, he had to talk to me and question me. And I had, from my knees down, the mash. And he asked me what, what that was. He knows what it was, but I said, I've been feeding hogs. And that was the end of it. Chuck desperately wanted to keep the family tradition going, just not in the same way it had been done in the past. So he began working on that path to do so, legally. My dad uh, was, had a false positive rating for uh, cancer. So my current employment was in law enforcement and I was actually traveling. I was busy most of the time. And whenever I was at home, I was on the busy, busy doing text or working on the computer. So I, even if I was there around my son or we would go and spend time with my dad, I wasn't actually spending quality time. Whenever uh, you know, we had that false diagnosis, it was very scary. So I wanted to think of a way to start up a business to spend more time, quality time, to where a lot of the stories that my grandpa told, you know, I'm remembering, you know, I don't have that much memory of it. And I wanted my son to cherish those memories and have something documented where we could sit around, make moonshine legally, you know, and I could have my son around it and be exposed to it, and it wouldn't be frowned upon. 
Chuck has a burning desire for moonshine. It's like most of everybody growing up, you know, that was part of their heritage. Chuck wanted to, to show the people the, the new right process of moonshine. He wants to show the public people, he wants to, to put some kind of end to the myth of, you know, some dumb redneck hillbilly backwoods don't have any education whatsoever. You know, there is, you have to use math every day here. You know, I mean, it's, you have to be somewhat educated. You have to have a lot of common sense. And he's just putting to rest some of the myths that people have about moonshine that's just not true. And he offers a tour through here and you can see for yourself, you know, kind of the process, how everything works. You better understand it. Whenever I started looking for a location, uh, after I spoke with the TTB, they gave me the format, the line, how I need to do it go after it and you need to get permission from the state of Georgia. Whenever I started uh, seeking permission from the state of Georgia, you had to get, be inside an, a jurisdiction that allows the sale of distilled spirits, either by the package, store, or by the drink. Um, you know, we look, currently live in an area that um, allows that. I spoke with that uh, city government. They was completely against it and said that it would be a bad image for that community for me to offer it. Um, you know, starting up a new business, you want to have support from your local government and support from the community. So I called a few people and I spoke with former mayor, uh, David Pennington, and he welcomed me here. He encouraged me to make contact with the Downtown Development Authority. They helped me find this location. So for you to apply in Georgia, you have to have a lease. Since this is a historical building, I had to get a letter from the State Historical Society granting permission and I'd submit that back into the TTB uh, to start all the paperwork. Um, but you know, coming to Dalton, that's one of the reasons why, uh, the only reason why I chose that name, Dalton Distillery. We really appreciate how the community's come around. We've got a lot of support. Um, you know, the Chamber of Commerce has been excellent. We have access to the Chamber of Commerce and the Downtown Development Authority. Uh, the city government officials uh, have been very encouragement and, and uh, uh, they actually passed a city ordinance to allow us to manufacture uh, inside of downtown. Now that the Dalton Distillery is official, having the opportunity to be a cultural destination as well as a historical venue is one of the next challenges. And as for the city of Dalton, the support doesn't stop there. Well, I hope their reception has been very warm here because uh, we welcome new business, we welcome um, different businesses, and this is kind of unique, and uh, I think it's an, an extra flavor to Dalton that we haven't had, and you know, we'd, anything to uh, keep the economy rolling here, and uh, I think these guys are gonna be a big part of it. It is gonna be a destination spot, um, and I think they're located in a very strategic place right here with the old train depot and the uh, Crest City train car. When we get those things up and moving a little more, uh, they're going to be part of the heartbeat of downtown. And, you know, we do have a lot of tourism here, a tourism opportunities that we're trying to capitalize on, and, and these guys can be a big part of that. He's so authentic. I mean, the overalls, the beard, I mean, he looks like he should be still in moonshine in somebody's backyard. I mean, he is, he is that authentic, and he really brings that, um, that genuine sense to the brand. So I think he's great for the brand. I mean, Chuck and Raymond are, are great guys, and, and I wish them all the best and hope they're very successful in this endeavor. Uh, the product's phenomenal. You would think 111 proof moonshine that it's going to kind of get you in the back of the throat, and you're going to be like, you expect it, but it's really not. It's very smooth. It's got that little bit of warmth. Very smooth moonshine. Living in Northwest Georgia, we are uh, blessed uh, to be the home of uh, floor covering manufacturing, primarily carpet manufacturing, uh, really across North America and around the world. We're a leader in that. Um, but that also uh, comes with sort of being a one horse, uh, you know, uh, industry or, or, or community as far as our local economy. So. Uh, is really as long as I've been alive, it's been a discussion uh, in Northwest Georgia and in the Dalton area that we want to continue to grow and diversify and have other things that we offer to the greater community um, and to the economy. So, 
when you look at a place like the Dalton Distillery, obviously not tied to that traditional manufacturing background, an opportunity to go into a different direction. Um, I think there's a, there's a unique aspect of the Dalton Distillery in that uh, you're telling a story that's linked to, to part of the bigger story of, of North Georgia in general. Uh, and certainly that is the, uh, the what I, around here would have been called the white label liquor, um, uh, that which was untaxed and, and certainly was done um, you know, off the, the legal system. And so this ties to that story. So from a tourism standpoint, the ability to sort of say, here's, here's how it's done and here's how it's, it's operating now, obviously in a, you know, in a legal setting, but this is its history and this is where this comes from and this is you know, the background. And we're, and we're in the geography where that story uh, you know, took place. Four of the main areas that we've identified for tourism, as far as leisure tourism, um, has been our um, Civil War heritage, our textile heritage, train heritage, and then our Cherokee heritage. So those are sort of the overarching um, areas that we um, market in terms of uh, getting people to stop and uh, see those uh, assets. While they're here, they're always interested in other things. What else is going on around town? So an establishment like the distillery is something different and unique that we have to share with guests. And, and obviously, different visitors have different interests, but this gives us something that is not common in a lot of destinations. And so it's something that is really uh, marketable for us to share with visitors while they're here. Chuck's actually worked on this place probably going on three years now. He spent his money, his time, him and his dad uh, to open this place up and worked out of their pockets for going on three years. So they have put a lot of effort. They didn't just say, you know, well, we got this money to burn. We want to go make moonshine. You know, they had worked and saved their money for this day to open this distillery. So, you know, it, it wasn't handed to them. They had to work for it which I think it makes it, it makes it a lot better in the end when they do succeed. They, they can say they did it on their own. In the commercial industry, um, a lot of um, well-known brands work to uh, protect their brand and sometimes overstep and look and attack smaller businesses. And that's what happened with us whenever we was using Real Georgia Moonshine. A Kentucky-based company attacked us saying that they owned the right to use Georgia and corn whiskey. So um, instead of fighting it, which uh, we checked into is going to be several thousand dollars, uh, we looked at about redoing a new label. Uh, so we used my dad's image called Raymond's Reserve. Um, put my dad's image on there, highlighted the state of Georgia, and um, put a star in, next to where Dalton is. These challenges would be enough to bring anyone to their knees, but not Chuck. He used this as an opportunity to bring in some expertise to overcome this and potentially take his product globally. Van, he came in, he was excited and interested and in just wanting to help us be in sales. We started looking into different things, and whenever we found out that uh, a lot of your gluten-free whiskeys or spirits is not being met to our customer base, it is a small niche market for a large distillery, but it's a good niche market for us. The landscape for moonshine, traditional moonshine, is so competitive and so cutthroat that it doesn't matter how good a quality product you have, yeah, that's irrelevant you're going to be, everything's going to be based on price. So the bigger distillers, the bigger the moonshines, the more established facilities, they're going to have a leg up. Because corn whiskey, not that many people want corn whiskey uh, by itself. What they want is, and what, and what they're accustomed to, is an aged whiskey, what's been in a whiskey barrel, or a bourbon, a lot of bourbon drinkers. Our Tazare is the first whiskey or liquor produced in the world. I mean, that's a big statement when you say the world, but according to the TTB, it's never been done before, either produced in the United States or imported into the United States. So they, we can't find the record where anybody's ever made sunflower whiskey before. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're the first producer of that sunflower spirit. Uh, and we're so excited about it for a simple reason. 
the taste it's so unique and it's so enjoyable even at very high proofs it has no burn you know we don't have any yeast in our process which helps tremendously you know we go through the natural natural fermentation process but on top of that when you can have a, a spirit that is 90 proof and you can drink it straight and you have no burn and you have a wonderful aftertaste that's left on your palate, you got something very unique. So we knew we had something unique and now we're at the process where we finally got the formulas approved by the TTB and now we are uh, working on the labels, getting them approved and then we'll be working on distribution. Now I really believe that we're gonna be a national brand with the sunflowers. After we found out and I've started studying more about sunflowers, Kansas, that's the, their state flower. I think that that would be a good way that we could break into that state. Um, in the Ukraine, that's their national flower. Russia uh, produces and grows more sunflowers than any other nation in the world. Uh, so I think that we can end up turning this into a huge international and national brand whenever you structure it properly and stay um, you know, with the right vision. We're going down a new frontier, something totally unknown and untried before. We know how to do it though. It took us a year to figure it out, but we know how to do it. It's not easy, but the quality of the product and bring something new to market that people have never seen before, never tasted. The excitement around when you tell people you got sunflower spirits is amazing. Everybody wants to try it. They have to try it. I can go and start talking about corn whiskey. Everybody says, oh, just like I did with Raymond, the first time I met him, I really wasn't interested in sampling it. But if he had had sunflower whiskey at that point, I would have had to. He still taught me into it. Raymond's a great salesman. So, but, but then we're very excited about that. Well, back then, about everybody drank uh, that, that I can remember. Ministers did, uh, politicians did, uh, and uh, uh, but there would be a few people could not handle it. I mean, I I remember we one guy when he got to, got a few drinks, he'd go home and whip his wife. So my dad, when he found that out, you know, never let him have another drink. So. He came one day and he said, hey, I need a drink bad. I'm, I'm in uh, bad. My dad said, I don't have any, not a bit. What he meant, I don't have none for he, you. I was small and I said, oh yeah, you do. And I, I told on him. And uh, I, I didn't get a whip, but I, I'll never forget that one. That was, I thought I was being a help, you know. But you didn't let no one ha nobody have it as going to go out and, and uh, harm somebody or their family or whatever. 